It is now my honor to introduce the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, the Honorable Dennis McDonough, head of our nation's second largest department of the federal government and the most critical government entity for health care, benefits, and compensation for millions of American veterans and families. Nominated by President Biden to lead the Department of Veterans Affairs, Secretary McDonough's nomination was confirmed by the United States Senate on February 8, 2021, and the following day was sworn in as the 11th Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Before his nomination, Secretary McDonough was already a known quantity to the President. For eight years, he served in the Obama-Biden White House in various prominent positions. Secretary McDonough served as the 26th White House Chief of Staff from February 2013 to January 2017, managing the White House staff, working across the Cabinet, and devising and enforcing goals, plans, and performance standards to preserve the Obama-Biden administration's reputation for effective ethical operations. Prior to his role as Chief of Staff, Secretary McDonough was Principal Deputy National Security Advisor from October 2010 to January 2013. He also served as the Chief of Staff for the National Security Staff and as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. He chaired the National Security Council Deputies Committee, leading the multi-agency team to address complex challenges, including crisis management and national security policymaking. And throughout his service in the White House, Secretary McDonough helped lead the Obama-Biden administration's work on behalf of military families and veterans. On January 27, 2021, during his confirmation hearing, Secretary McDonough testified to Congress, quote, I will work tirelessly to build and restore VA's trust as the premier agency for ensuring the well-being of America's veterans. After all, there is no more sacred obligation nor noble undertaking than to uphold our promises to our veterans, whether they came home decades ago or days ago." End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to our 123rd National Convention, the 11th Secretary of the Veterans Affairs, the Honorable Dennis Richard McDonough. Good morning. Thank you, Fritz, for that very kind and generous and long and boring introduction. Thank you for your dedicated service to our country and your steadfast leadership as National Commander-in-Chief of VFW. It's an honor to be here with you and with so many other great veterans and staunch advocates for veterans. Folks like Tim Borland, your incoming Commander-in-Chief. Kevin Jones, who's retiring this year after decades of service to veterans. Ryan Gallucci, your fantastic National Service Director. All of the veteran service officers, three whom I just met backstage, who are here today, who serve vets on the ground every day. Most of all, to the veterans their family members, caregivers, and survivors here today. It's great to be with you for the 123rd National Convention. Let me start with a story, the story of Roxanne Payne. From the time she was a teenager, Roxanne knew that she wanted to serve our country. So she decided to join the Air Force and wound up serving four years on active duty. She's a hero, an example of the very best of America. 
Someone who dreamt about serving our country then went out and did it. But the cost of Roxanne's selfless service was steep and stayed with her long after she left the military. She suffered from post-traumatic stress and military sexual trauma. And then, like so many others during the pandemic, she fell on tough times. She went through a divorce and then, all of a sudden, contracted COVID-19, which kept her from doing her job and made it difficult for her to support her kids. Long story short, Roxanne found herself unable to pay her electricity bill, unable to make ends meet in the country she had served so well. Then she reached out to her local VA, and we told her about VFW's Unmet Needs program. So she filed an application, and in no time at all, you got her the aid that she needed and helped her pay her bills. You helped her. We helped her in the time when she needed it most. In her own words, she says, you kept our lights on. I can't imagine what would have happened if they were turned off. The support really meant the world to me and to my family. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. That right there is the impact of the VFW. And that's what our partnership between VA and VFW is all about, working together to deliver for vets like Roxanne. You know, when the President spoke to you last year, he talked about our nation's one truly sacred, sacred obligation, to prepare and equip our troops when we send them into harm's way, and to care for them, for you and your families when you return home. The second part of that obligation, caring for veterans and their families when you return home, that's our shared mission at VA and VFW. It's our job, our responsibility to serve veterans, their families, caregivers, survivors, as well as they have served us, as well as they, as well as you, has, have served our country. And for 123 years at the VFW, you've done exactly that, by delivering for vets in need via programs like Unmet Needs, and by helping veterans get every benefit they've earned and so rightly deserve. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your partnership. And more than that, thank you for all you do for veterans like Roxanne because they, their families, caregivers, and survivors deserve our very best. And together, we'll never, ever settle for anything less. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what we've done over the past year and what we're going to do in the year ahead to deliver for vets. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that it's been a tough year for everybody. Between COVID continuing to be a very real threat, the 20th anniversary of the attacks on 9-11, the return of war to Europe after all we've done to secure peace in that vital region, and everything else, this has been a time when, for one reason or another, many vets have needed our help at VA and have needed your help at VFW. But that just means that our shared mission has never been more important than it is right now. And I'm proud to say that despite everything, together we're stepping up for vets in this time when they need us most, just like vets have stepped up for our country when we've needed them, when we've needed you most. Since President Biden took office, we've delivered more care and more vets more care and more benefits to more veterans than any time in our nation's history. When it comes to delivering those benefits that vets have earned and deserve, we are processing veteran claims faster 
than ever before. We've already completed more board hearings this year than any year in board history, and we've worked together to get the claims backlog down to its lowest total in years. When it comes to honoring vets with the lasting resting places they deserve, we are now providing almost 94 percent of vets with access to burial sites within 75 miles of their homes. And we've expanded our Veterans Legacy Memorial, which keeps veteran stories alive long after they're gone, to approximately 4.5 million veterans. When it comes to providing world-class health care to vets and to their families, study after study show that we're delivering better health outcomes for veterans than the private sector, which is why 90 percent of vets now trust us to deliver their care. And when it comes to advocating for vets with your support, President Biden is leading the way by making veterans a core part of his unity agenda, including by securing the biggest budget proposal for vets in VA history, delivering the first toxic exposure presumptives for vets who have fought our wars for the past 30 years, and bringing the historic PACT Act to the brink of expansion of veteran benefits, the largest expansion of veterans' benefits ever, to the brink of passage. And look, all of that work, every bit of it adds up to the one statistic that matters most. Veterans' lives saved, veterans' lives improved by the work we do together. We've made these strides by acting oursel asking ourselves three core questions every day we come to work, every time we make a decision, and every time we set a goal. First, are we putting the veteran at the center of everything we do? That, may, that means making VA easy for veterans to use via projects like the new VA mobile app, which give vets access to their benefits right on their phones. It means turning to, it's working to turn every veteran entry into, entryway into VA, whether it's a transition assistance program or the GI Bill or health care, turning that into a front door to all VA services so vets can access all we have to offer, all that they have earned. And it means making sure that we're delivering for vets on time, every time, via projects like claims automation, which is cutting claims processing times for certain conditions down from several months to several days. The second question we ask ourselves is, are we improving outcomes for veterans with everything we do? That means timely access to world-class care, earned benefits, and the lasting resting places that vets deserve, no matter what. Because vets, not us, are the ultimate judges of our success. And the third question we ask ourselves goes back to this, something that the President charged VA to do every day on the day I was sworn in. Fight like hell for vets their families, caregivers, and survivors. Fight like hell. So not a day goes by when we don't use that charge, that question, to guide us. That's our North Star. That's our job. That's how we've gotten to where we are now, and that's how we'll get where we're going for vets, their family members, caregivers, and survivors. A couple of examples. First. We're fighting like hell to maximize access to world-class care for veterans across the country. That's always top of mind for us, but it's particularly so as the pandemic continues to put veterans and their families at risk. That's why we encourage all of you to get vaccinated, get your booster shots at VA vaccination clinics like the one our great team from the KCVA is running right here at this convention. And that's why we're, we will stop at nothing to make sure that vets have access to the best possible experience whenever they come to VA for care. At home, in the community, or in VA. For those getting their care at home, we're meeting vets where they are by doubling down on telehealth and teleappeals. We're also supporting our caregivers who are critical to helping veterans age at home 
by, extending, by expanding the program of comprehensive assistance this October to cover all generations, every generation of veteran. And by changing our policies to allow even more vets and their caregivers into the program so they can get the support they need. For vets who are getting care in the community, we're making sure that their experiences are timely and seamless so that they get that care whenever they need it. And for those getting their care directly from VA, we're going to modernize our facilities because vets in the 21st century should not be forced to receive care in early 20th century buildings. Instead, we need to build a healthcare footprint with the right facilities in the right places that provide the right care for vets in every part of the country. And that's exactly what we're doing. And look, the bottom line with access is the same as ever. Vets and VA care do better. Our clinicians know veterans. In many cases, they are veterans. And there is nobody better at caring for veterans than VA. Just let's look at the statistics. Vets who come to VA emergency rooms via ambulance are 20% more likely to survive in the following 30 days than those who were transported to private hospitals. So please, whenever a vet comes to you asking where they should get their care, send them to us. Because I promise you we're going to get them the world-class care that they've earned. Next, we're fighting like hell to end veteran homelessness, a phrase that simply shouldn't exist in America. Our focus here is on two simple goals, getting more vets into homes and preventing them from falling into homelessness in the first place. And we're making real progress. Last October, for example, we sent two ambitious goals to address veteran homelessness in Los Angeles, where there are more homeless vets than anywhere in America. The first goal was to get all of the roughly 40 homeless veterans living on Veterans Row, a homeless encampment, into housing. The second was to get 500 vets in, a, in Los Angeles into housing by the end of the year, making sure they were home for the holidays. I'm proud to say that with VFW's help, we not only accomplished those goals, we exceeded them. And that's just the beginning. Nationwide, this year, we're going to get 38,000 vets into permanent housing, 38,000 vets. We're not going to try to do it or take our best shot at doing it or earn the Sportsmanship Award for trying to do it. With your help, we're going to do it. In fact, we're halfway there. I just learned on Friday afternoon that through June, we've permanently housed more than 19,000 vets already this year. So halfway through the year, we're halfway to the goal. And as we continue to get this done, we will be driving hard on prevention, too, by increasing the housing supply, by making existing housing more affordable, and by getting every veteran the wraparound services, the health care, the mental health care, the substance dis use disorder treatment that they need. Because no veteran should be homeless in a country that they fought to defend. Not one. And we, and we will deliver for them together. Third, we are fighting like hell to prevent veteran suicide. You may have seen VA's recent report on veteran suicides in 2019, the most current year we have for data. A couple big things stand out to me from that report. First, more than 6,000 veterans died by suicide that year. That's devastating, heartbreaking, unacceptable, and it's why this work is so critical. But that report also reminded us of something else which is that suicide prevention is possible, and there is hope. Because there were 399 fewer veteran suicides in 2019 than there had been in 2018, the biggest decrease in 20 years. That's 399 vets who are alive today. 
getting a second chance at life. Largely because of your work, of our work, of the work of the VFW community. Nothing matters more than that. So we're looking to build on that momentum. Together, we're providing the first of their kind grants to suicide prevention organizations on the ground in communities where communities know their veterans best. By rolling out 988, the new National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which connects vets quickly and directly to the Veteran Crisis Line. By dialing 988 and then pushing one for veterans. By continuing to offer telemental health sessions to veterans who want them, making sure they get their mental health care exactly when they need it and not a second later. And ramping up lethal means safety efforts by war prevent to prevent warning signs from turning into tragedy. And there's so much more we're doing. Suicide prevention is our top clinical priority, bar none. And together with VFW, we're going to keep saving vets' lives and help them not only survive, but to thrive. Fourth, we're continuing to fight like hell to make sure that all veterans feel safe and welcome at VA. Not some veterans, all veterans. That means getting women vets our fastest growing cohort of vets the care they've earned and they deserve. It means making sure that LBGTQ plus vets feel supported and well served by every part of VA. It means investigating, identifying, and eliminating any racial disparities that exist at VA and setting up processes to prevent them from ever recurring. It means helping non-citizen vets stay in the U.S. where they belong and making sure that eligible deported vets have access to VA benefits. And it means delivering care and benefits to those with other than honorable discharges, too. Sometimes they need our help most. Because at VA, we don't serve some vets. We serve all vets. No veteran is going to have to fight to get quality care and benefits that they've earned, no matter who they are, where they're from, or who they loved. And one more thing to any veteran, or any veteran spouse who wants to come work with us to help to deliver this care for all vets, our doors, our, app, our applications are always open at va.gov slash jobs. We've got a big job coming up with the PACT Act, and I want to make sure that we fill those with VF, VFW-connected professionals. There's no better mission in the world. We want you to come help us do it. Last, and in no way least, as I just mentioned, we're fighting like hell to pass the PACT Act. A new bill that, if passed, will keep our nation's promise to veterans who suffer from conditions related to environmental exposure and establish the presumptive connection of hypertension to Agent Orange. For anybody who doesn't know, while vets were off fighting for us, for our freedoms, many of them were, burning in, uh, were breathing in toxic fumes in particulate matter from burn pits and other sources. And months or years later, they've developed conditions that followed them home from war, that impacted their lives, in some cases took their lives, long after the final bullets of war were fired. It's our job to provide those vets and their survivors with benefits and care for those conditions. And if passed, the PACT Act will finally do that. This is a monumental moment for veterans and a monumental moment for our partnership, too. And I know you've put everything you have behind supporting this bill. I just heard from Bob and, and Ryan that you sent 6,000 emails uh, from this hall last night. So 
So I know you've made this your number one legislative priority. So on behalf of vets and on behalf of VA, I say I thank you. We're thrilled about the bill for a lot of reasons, too. The first is that we'll bring hundreds of thousands of new vet, hundreds of thousands of new vets into VA care and increase the health care benefits for many more vets already in our care, which is fantastic and will result in better health outcomes across the board for vets. Second, thanks to your advocacy, and let me just say, your team, when you say advocate, your team manifests that. And I don't say that because it's always great when they advocate, advocate to me. Sometimes it's kind of painful, I have to say but they are tireless. Thanks to that advocacy, this bill will invest in VA's infrastructure and workforce to help us deliver that additional care. 31 new authorizations for new clinics in your communities across the country. 31 new clinics. Third, and most importantly, this bill will ensure that generations of veterans and their survivors will get the toxic exposure benefits they've earned and, in some cases, have been waiting for for years, even decades. Addressing toxic exposure is and has been a top priority for this administration, with President Biden adding new presumptives for service connection for asthma, rhinitis, sinusitis, and nine rare respiratory cancers already. Looking ahead, the PACT Act is going to go even further, delivering toxic exposure for vets, guaranteeing, guaranteeing benefits for more than 20 burn pit and toxic exposure-related conditions, strengthening our toxic exposure research, and solidifying our new process for establishing presumptives, which puts one goal above all else, getting vets timely access to the benefits that they've earned and that they deserve, that you've earned, that you deserve. In short, it's no exaggeration to say that the passage of this bill will be an historic moment for vets, and it's an honor to be part of it. And among so much else, this legislation is a huge vote of confidence in you, your commitment your dedication, your expertise, and the strength and, and durability of our partnership, a partnership that's absolutely critical right now. Because when this bill passes, we're going to need your help. We're going to need your help communicating to veterans about the new law and what it means for them and their families. We're going to need your feedback about how vets are feeling about the PACT Act implementation, about what's going well, and, God forbid, what's not going well. Because nobody knows the veterans in your communities better than you do. We're going to need your support and guidance as we work through the PACT Act claims caseload, which could number in the millions. And most of all, we're going to need your help getting veterans to apply for their PACT Act benefits because we want every veteran, every single veteran, to apply for the benefits they've earned. So no, implementation and execution of this bill will not be easy. But nothing of this magnitude and of this importance ever is easy. In fact, nothing veterans have ever done for this country has been easy. But vets have stepped up for us, and now it's our turn to step up for them. So we're going to do this incredibly important work together. And in doing it, and doing it well, we'll honor the nation's vets and deliver for them. So from access to ending, from access to ending homelessness to the PACT Act, that's where we're going. That's how we're going to fight like hell with, for vets, for their families, for their caregivers, for their survivors. And make no mistake, we can't do any of this without you. 
To me, our shared mission all comes back to the promise that our country makes whenever somebody signs up to serve in the military. It's a promise that's as simple as it is fundamental. If you take care of us, we'll take care of you. If you fight for us, we'll fight for you. If you serve us, we'll serve you when you come home. The thing is, our country as a whole makes that promise. But it's us at VA and VFW who are most responsible for keeping that promise. For 123 years, you've been doing exactly that. By making VA what it is today and delivering vets billions in earned benefits, by serving generations as vet, of vets as well as they've s served us, and by keeping the lights on for veterans like Roxanne Payne, even in the moments that feel the darkest, especially in the moments that feel the darkest. So thank you all of you for putting up with me today for that long introduction and the even longer speech. Thank you for your partnership. Most of all, thank you for joining us in fighting like hell for vets every single day. Let's keep it up. May God bless our nation's veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors, and may we always give them our very best. Thank you.